the father of the space age. That's what they called. You know what he said? I'm not the father of the space age. That's the real father of the space age. Okay, now this guy who was at Cal Poly Tech, right? This guy, Jack Parsons, was openly a devil worshiper. He developed the fuel that enabled us to penetrate the stratosphere. Satellites could not have come about without this guy. In his diary that he himself wrote, he had a dream. This is 1948. He had a dream where he saw somebody that he calls Belial Dajjal. And he tells him, you are helping me. Okay, I'm not making this up. You think I'm making this up? Wallahi, I'm not making this up. You go look it up yourself. Okay, so where's all this stuff coming from? Where's all, seriously, where's it all coming from? <laughs> We're in the age of the Dajjal, you know. It's just Allahu Anam, when and where and what, but this is it, people. As far as I'm concerned, it's end game. Huh? That's why Allahu Akbar, water and prayer and qibla can't take that away from us. So just keep doing, you know. I mean, Khabab wanted to, you know, he wanted to ask for death, you know. And he was with the Prophet Sallallahu Can you imagine that? Wanting to ask for death and you're living with the Prophet? So what about the age of the Dajjal? People will go by grave saying, would that I was in his place. Laytani makanahu. So we need to prepare as much as we can. You know, but the, the technology, if you study where all this technology comes from, okay, you know, Read about the magic and the enlightenment period. All these scientists were magicians. They were all into black magic. You read about uh, Francis Bacon. He, I, I just read a, a, a biography of Francis Bacon called Knowledge is Power, Magic and, and, and the Creation of Modern Science. Francis Bacon was reading all these magical books. Uh, 2001 the Space Odyssey. What's his name? No, the guy that wrote it. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke, great technologist. He actually uh, has most of the patents that enabled the satellites, right? If you look at his interview with BBC in 1961, where he predicts the internet, he predicts uh, the cell phones, he predicts uh, texting. He said that by the year 2000, people are going to have handheld devices that enable to talk to anybody anywhere, right? Arthur C. Clarke said, and he has three laws of technology. One of his laws is no technology reaches a level of, of complexity except it becomes indistinguishable from magic. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not a big fan. I'm not a Luddite. Right? I'm using a microphone right now. I'm not a Luddite. But this whole worshipful attitude towards technology to me is really stupid. And, and, and if you want to read an interesting book, it's called Giving Up the Gun, uh, which is about the fact that the Japanese chose consciously to ban the gun. And they did it because of the samurai lobby. Because the samurais thought it was disgusting that a man could spend 30 years becoming a master swordsman and some idiot could pick up a gun and just kill him. They just thought it was just so unesthetic. And so they outlawed the gun, even though the Japanese were making the best guns in the 16th century on the entire planet. They had solved the problem of, uh, of the water because they used to go out when it was wet or damp and the powder got damp. They actually had waterproof uh, powder kegs in their guns in the 16th century. And we know Japanese technology. I mean, it just took them a little while to get used to the cars and now they're making better cars than any of the American cars. I mean, the Japanese have itqan when they do things, but they outlawed the gun. This whole idea that because it exists, oh, why do we do it? Because. You know, it's like these people say, why did we climb Mount McKinley? You know, or what, what's the K2? Is that what's K2? What's the tallest mountain in the world? 
Everest. Everest. Why, did, why do we climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. I mean, what a stupid thing to say. That is so dumb to me. It's like these chirpas down at the bottom. The only reason they'd ever climb that is because you're paying them. They've been at the bottom of that mountain for centuries. They never thought about climbing. It's like, I'm not going up there. You know, and what do they get up there? You know, they get up there and, and they can't breathe. First indication, you're probably not supposed to be there. But they literally get blown off the mountain by wind. You know how many people have died? That, that British lady who left her kids in England to go climb Mount Everest. She got blown off. She orphaned her children. SubhanAllah. Well, because, oh, we should do it just because we can. Just do it. That, those are, these are demonic uh, slogans of this, of this uh, age. Just do it. You know, no limits. I mean, who made that one up? No limits? What do you mean? You, all you are is limits. You're limited in your space. You're limited in the decibels that you can produce. You're limited in, in your breathing. You're limited in your intellect. Everything's limits. No limits? What are you talking about? Stupid people. <laughs> no, seriously, just mad people. Anyway, time to pray. Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation because the prophet invariably falls between two stools. If his predictions sound at all reasonable, you can be quite sure that in 20 or at most 50 years, the progress of science and technology has made him seem ridiculously conservative. On the other hand, if by some miracle a prophet could describe the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would sound so absurd, so far-fetched, that everybody would laugh him to scorn. This has proved to be true in the past, and it will undoubtedly be true, even more so, of the century to come. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So, if what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll have failed completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. Let's start by looking at the city of the future. Some people think that it, it will be like this. And they're quite right. In fact, everything you see now already exists. All the materials, all the ideas, these things could be put into practice immediately. But what about the city of the day after tomorrow? Say, the year 2000. I think it will be completely different. In fact, it may not even exist at all. Oh, I'm not thinking of the atom bomb and the next Stone Age. I'm thinking of the incredible breakthrough which has been made possible by developments in communications, particularly the transistor and, above all, the communication satellite. These things will make possible a world in which we can be in instant contact with each other, wherever we may be, where we can contact our friends anywhere on Earth, even if we don't know their actual physical location. It will be possible in that age, perhaps only 50 years from now, for a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali, just as well as he could from London. In fact, if it proves worthwhile, almost any executive skill, any administrative skill, even any physical skill, could be made independent of distance. I am perfectly serious when I suggest that one day we may have brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New Zealand. When that time comes, the whole world will have shrunk to a point, and the traditional role of the city as a meeting place for man would have cease to make any sense. In fact, men will no longer commute. They will communicate. They won't have to travel for business anymore. They'll only travel for pleasure. I only hope that when that day comes and when the city is abolished, the whole world isn't turned into one giant suburb. In that world of the future, 
we will not be the only intelligent creatures. One of the coming techniques will be what we might call bioengineering, the development of intelligent and useful servants among the other animals on this planet, particularly the great apes and in the oceans, the dolphins and whales. You know, it's a scandal of which we should be thoroughly ashamed that prehistoric man tamed all the domestic animals we have today. We haven't added one in the last 5,000 years. It's about time we did so. And with our present knowledge of animal psychology and genetics, we could certainly solve the servant problem uh, with the help of the uh, monkey kingdom. Uh, of course, eventually our super chimpanzees would start forming trade unions and we be right back where we started. However, the most intelligent inhabitants of that future world won't be men or monkeys. They'll be machines, the remote descendants of today's computers. Now, the present-day electronic brains are complete morons, but this will not be true in another generation. They will start to think, and eventually they will completely outthink their makers. Is this depressing? I don't see why it should be. We superseded the Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men, and we presume we're an improvement. I think we should regard it as a privilege to be stepping stones to higher things. I suspect that organic or biological evolution has about come to its end, and we are now at the beginning of inorganic or mechanical evolution, which will be thousands of times swifter. But even if the future does belong to the robots, our bodies and our brains still have immense untapped potentialities. For example, to cope with the information explosion, we may develop a machine for recording information directly onto the brain, as today we can record a symphony on tape. So we may one day be able to become instant experts, uh, learning Chinese overnight, for example. Or we may be able to recall completely memories of past events so that we seem to relive them. In fact, techniques are already known for doing this in a rather limited way at the present. Alternatively, we may prefer to totally erase past unpleasant memories. Why would Gog and Magog throw arrows at the sky? Will they be targeting jinns or aliens? Is there a possibility of a jinn or alien invasion prior to this event? You have to go to Surah Rahman to recognize and understand the link between Gog and Magog, the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance, NATO, and Star Wars. And Star Wars. In the, must be a hundred thousand lectures I've already delivered on Gog and Magog. <laughs> must be a hundred thousand lectures, where nobody else lectures on the subject, no, I'm the only one, uh, in which I've identified Gog and Magog, okay, uh, Surat uh, al-Anbiya, the, the Karya. And that Gog and Magog would be the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance, which has NATO as its uh, military arm. That's Gog and Magog. Mm. But the link between Gog and Magog and Star Wars is there in Surah Al-Rahman. Mm. Sorry. And, uh, and yes, it most certainly has a connection with the jinn. That is why you have the verse repeated how many times? 31 times. فَبِأَيِّ أَلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ 31 times. Rabbikuma means two people. One, human beings, and the other, jinn, and both evil. Hmm? So the verse of the Quran which is linked with Star Wars and with shooting arrows up into the sky, which is the missiles and so on, is the ayah which, in which Allah says, Ya ma'shar al-jinni wal-ins. 
and he's not speaking to all human beings and he's not speaking to all jinns he's speaking to the human beings and the jinn who have been constantly addressed in this surah and 31 times he has asked them he has said for be ayalai rabbikum atukaziban so you can't make a mistake who is he talking about He's talking about this community of human beings who are evil and this community of jinn who are evil and who are in alliance with each other and it is these people who address Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins In istata'atu man tanfuzu min aktaris samawat There you are, the Star Wars Aktaris samawat wal If you wish to embark on the effort to explore and penetrate the stratas of the sky and the samawat and the stratas of the earth which includes the ocean, the depths of the ocean Fanfuzu Go ahead and pursue the effort So the jinn are helping human beings in this effort of missiles and satellites and all of these things But then Allah, I think I'm speaking a little bit too much today I'm, le I'm taking too much out of the, too, the cat is coming out of the bag. I don't want NATO to know this. <laughs> I don't want to NATO know the, to know this. No, I, I prefer NATO does not know this at this time. No, let them go <laughs> do their research in Surah Rahman. Yes, I think I spoke enough. I don't want to speak anymore and reveal anymore. That there is in Surah Rahman that which explains definitely that the jinn are supporting the efforts for exploration of, this, of the, the stratus of the sky and the depths of the earth. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-insi in istata'tum an تنفذوا من أقطار السماوات والأرض فانفذوا لا تنفذون إلا بسلطان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان يرسل عليكما شواظ من ونحاس فلا تنتصران فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان فإذا شقت السماء فكانت وردة كالدهان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان فيومئذ لا يسأل عن ذنبه إنس ولا جان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان يعرف المجرمون بسيماهم فيؤخذ بالنواصي والأقدام فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان هذه جهنم التي يكذب بها المجرمون يطوفون بينها وبين حميم آن فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان